China, it's truly a vast and fascinating country. 9,600,000 square kilometers of land, 3 million square kilometers of seas. And it's never still, changing with the rotation of the seasons. To fly like a bird is to see things that are beyond your imagination. You visit places you would never before have dreamed of. And even familiar places, when you look down on them from on high, will assume a completely different appearance. We'll take you to explore places close at hand and far away. To witness nature and geography, humanity and history. Join us as we embark on a unique journey across the sky. Where China reaches its northernmost point lies Heilongjiang province. Here, the greater and lesser Kingan Mountains are covered by an ocean of trees. The Heilongjiang River waters two vast alluvial plains, helping to make the province China's largest granary. In this program, we'll get a feel for the snowy northern border area and look from above on stunning scenery dominated by frozen mists. We'll chase after some skiers and experience the extreme challenges of winter. We'll head to the city of Harbin, where we'll take part in a festival of ice and snow. And finally, we'll experience the fun snow has to offer. If winter was ever nostalgic, no doubt it would remember Heilongjiang province as its home. This village is located in China's northernmost part. It's called Beiji or Arctic Village, even though the Arctic Circle is 1,500 kilometers away. That said, it certainly conforms with most people's idea of what Arctic scenery looks like. One of the coldest places in China, it holds the national record for the lowest ever recorded temperature of minus 52.3 degrees centigrade. Differences in the length of day and night are particularly pronounced here. During the long winter nights, the cold is intensified. At the height of summer, the days have 17 hours of sunlight and the land is full of life and energy. From beneath the ice and snow, a land emerges that is warm. This is Heilongjiang province. At Kuarbin, there's a huge contrast in the scenery depending on the time of year. The normally stark landscape can amaze you with its beauty, if you come in the right season. The hydropower station through its discharge of hot water keeps the river unfrozen even in winter.
At night, as the temperature plummets, this warm vapor meets much colder air and turns into icicles clinging to the trees. In Kuarbin, the beauty of the icicles is slow to fade. Moisture frozen into different shapes is a feature of this northernmost part of China. It's almost as if the pause button has been pressed, causing time to stand still on the frozen landscape. But people can always find a way to press play. A popular winter pastime here is skiing. The ideal time for skiing is the afternoon. Warmed by the morning sun, the snow has become slightly sticky, and this helps beginners to control their skis. A professional skier can easily achieve speeds of up to 70 kilometers an hour. The world record is just over 250 kilometers an hour. This is the highest land speed humans can reach without the aid of powered equipment. While some people like to ski at the speed of the wind, others prefer to challenge themselves by swimming in freezing water. Normally, 10 degrees Celsius is considered a suitable temperature for outdoor winter swimming. But in Heilongjiang, people take the plunge when it's minus 20 or even minus 30. Such severe cold is a challenge for the pool itself. If there's no one in it to keep the water moving, it'll quickly freeze over. The severe weather here not only inspires people to challenge themselves physically, but also nurtures artistic creation. Here, ice from the frozen Songhua River is being divided up into large blocks. Picks are used to chop away at the frozen river until the blocks are completely separated. Each block weighs up to 500 kilograms. It takes several people to haul each one onto the riverbank. These harvested blocks of ice are then transported to a nearby construction site. Even in winter, snowmakers are needed to help create this famous world of ice and snow. Helped by the large machines, the skilled craftsmen can turn the ice into practically any shape they want. Creating the site for the festival of ice and snow will take 10,000 workers a month. Harbin first staged its famous ice and snow world in 1999 to greet the new millennium. It's been held every winter since.
Each year, a new theme is chosen for the festival. In 2016, to mark the 18th anniversary of Harbin's ice and snow world, 18 ice peaks were created. This is where a stage for the 2017 CCTV Spring Festival Gala was set up. People here have an innate ability to make use of the snow. Ice becomes bricks and snow walls. In this way, they've created a winter kingdom like something out of a fairy tale. Snow can deliver unexpected opportunities and pleasant surprises. Flying to the southernmost point in Heilongjiang brings us to China's Snow Town. The annual snowfall here is heavier than anywhere else in the country, and the snow can stay on the ground for more than 200 days of the year. In Snowtown, forklift trucks are essential to survival. Following a snowfall during the night, people can wake up to find their front doors blocked. This is when the forklift trucks prove their worth. Tourists are fascinated by the roe deer. And dogs serve as drivers. The reindeer are also local celebrities whose appearance attracts plenty of interest. Workers from the Shuangfeng Forestry Station used to live here. Today, it's a popular scenic spot. The old workers' quarters have been converted into family-run inns, and former lumbermen have become inn keepers. No matter how cold the weather, there's never any lack of cheer. Here, sport can involve fierce competitions on ice. These contests even include something more commonly seen on water, dragon boat racing. Another surprise is how the tires and tractors work together. It seems that people feel closer to the lake when it's frozen. Hovercraft are great favorites here. When the ice and snow melts at the end of winter, these craft will be converted into motorboats. When spring arrives, the plants and animals will awaken. They will grow strongly as long as the sunshine remains bright. Next, we'll see nature as she was in remote antiquity, and we'll unveil the secret of Jingpo Lake. We'll pay a visit to a huge family of volcanoes at the end of the earth. 
And finally, in a prehistoric world, we'll picture what dinosaurs really looked like. Jingpo is China's largest mountain barrier lake formed as a result of volcanic eruptions. The spectacular flow of water that we see here is immune to the quiet changes of the seasons. Water and cliffs are frozen together to form an icy wonderland. Beneath the cliff is Black Dragon Pool, 60 meters deep. This man is 60 years old and he's been plunging into the water like this every day for the past 30 years. It's not a pastime for the faint-hearted, yet there's little cause for concern, as deep down the water is surprisingly warm. In winter, the average temperature here is minus 20, yet the temperature at the bottom of the pool remains above plus 10. This is due to the presence of hot springs. The hot springs result from volcanic activity. Heilongjiang is one of the most volcanically active regions of China. 50 kilometers to the north is an area known as a natural museum of volcanoes. This is one of China's youngest volcanoes. A mere 200 years have passed since it last erupted. A Qing Dynasty general in charge of guarding the border witnessed that eruption and sent a report to the Kangxi Emperor. Lava spewed out in all directions. Some of it cooled, solidified and became part of the landscape. But a large part was blocked by the Bai He River and as a result, five interconnected lakes formed. The lakes were named Wu Da Lianchu, or Five Linked Pools. In total, 14 volcanoes surround the Wu Da Lianchu lakes. In the crater of Mount Yaochuan, a temple has been built. The roar of nature has been replaced by the chanting of sutras. South Gurlachio Mountain is regarded as the symbol of the Wuda Lianchu Lake area. Not only is it the oldest of the 14 mountains here, but also at its top, there's a natural lake. Over the course of a million years, a thick layer of humus soil formed around the crater. Plants flourished in it, stopping any rainwater escaping from the crater. And so, a lake gradually formed. People are always fascinated by dinosaurs. In this dinosaur graveyard, 
hundreds of fossils await discovery. At the time when they lived here 65 million years ago, the temperature was 10 degrees higher than it is now. The climate was essentially subtropical. We usually think that a dinosaur's skin must have been like that of an elephant or rhino. But was it? In 2010, dinosaur fossils were discovered that contained a pigment similar to what's found in the plumage of birds. The experts concluded that some dinosaurs might have had coloured feathers similar to a bird's. Perhaps one day these dinosaur statues will be altered to incorporate bright plumage. Next, our flight will take us to a forest. We'll fly over the greater King Anne Mountains and listen to stories of greenery being reborn. On an autumn day, we'll encounter the colourful forests of the lesser King Anne Mountains. And we'll meet some adorable forest animals and play chase with the king of the forest. Only by flying over the greater King Anne Mountains do you get a real feel for just how vast this range is. This 73,000 square kilometre forest covers one-sixth of Heilongjiang province. At one time, the forest was devastated by logging and fires but now, thanks to a replanting campaign carried out since the founding of New China in 1949, it's largely been restored to its former glory. In 1987, a calamitous forest fire swept over the greater King Anne Mountains. The city was lucky to retain some of its forest. A tenth of the greater King Anne Mountains forest was destroyed in that fire. 50,000 people spent 28 days bringing the fire under control. A memorial was erected so that the fire wouldn't be forgotten. Heading southeast, we reach the Lesser King Anne Mountains, home to the Korean Pine. Squirrels hide pine nuts for retrieval later, but they often forget where they've left them. In the spring, the lost nuts start to emerge from the earth, expanding the forest. The Lesser King Anne Mountains are home to a variety of trees. In autumn, the area is painted in warm colours. In the past, this forest was exploited for its resources. Trains ran through the Lesser King Anne Mountains, carrying away logs and coal. But these days, the railway is the ideal place from which visitors can appreciate the stunning forest scenery. In this eco-friendly era, people are more interested in the beauty nature has to offer. From on high, it's hard to see the wildlife living among the trees. An artificial breeding centre is the place to see them at close quarters. 
On the southern slopes of the Lesser Kingan Mountains live a herd of seeker deer. The spots on their bodies are a means of protection developed over a long period of evolution. In summer, they resemble the spots of sunlight that penetrate the foliage. As long as the deer remain still, it's virtually impossible to see them. The fate of the forests has a direct impact on the native wildlife. The park is home to 500 Siberian tigers. Descended from just eight purebreds, they've lived in the specially created reserve since birth. Until recently, Siberian tigers were on the verge of extinction in China. Breeding bases were established to protect them. At the breeding bases, the Siberian tigers are trained in the skills they'll need to survive in the wild. Clearly, the tigers are regaining the ferocity that made them the kings of the forest. For the tigers, the aircraft is an intruder into their territory. But to catch it, they'll need to run quite a bit faster. The future looks bright for these tigers. With the balance of the forest ecology being restored, it may not be too long before they're roaming the forests wild and free once again. The fertile black soil of this vast plain has given rise to agricultural wonders. The lakes here are at the same time busy and tranquil. Flying westward will join a group of winter fishermen and keep an appointment with some red-crowned cranes. And we'll check out an oil-producing city that has preserved its wetlands. Xinjiang Kou means intersection of three rivers. In fact, just two rivers meet here, the Heilongjiang and the Songhua. The two-tone river created by the convergence is counted as the third. It's the humus in the Heilongjiang River that gives it its dark green hue, while the yellow of the Songhua is caused by mud and sand. Due to the differing densities of the sediment in the two rivers, it takes time for the colors to mix. To the east is a plain, the largest in the province. This plain was created by floodwaters from the Heilongjiang, Songhua and Wu Su Li rivers. Traditionally, the area was known as Bei Da Huang, the Great Northern Wilderness. In the 1950s, tens of thousands of people waged a land reclamation campaign here. 
As a result, Bei Da Huang was transformed into Bei Da Tang, the Great Northern Granary. A local saying goes as follows, seize the black soil and oil will seep out. Stick chopsticks in the soil and they will grow. The annual grain yield of Bei Da Tang is over 30 million tons. That's enough to feed 100 million people for an entire year. Reclaiming land used to be a matter of survival, but today to protect the ecosystem, cultivation in Bei Da Tang has gradually been halted and the wetland lost during the reclamation is slowly returning to its original state. In the north of the Sanjiang Plain lies the largest freshwater lake in Heilongjiang. A natural dike divides it into two quite distinctive bodies of water, the greater and the lesser Kanka lakes. Wind from the Pacific causes waves to roll across the greater Kanka lake, making it as rough as a sea. But on the lesser Kanka Lake, the vegetation is a natural barrier to the wind, so it always presents a scene of peace and calm. As we continue westward, the temperature falls and the once flowing water becomes frozen. Pinpointing schools of fish is a real test of the fisherman's skill. In winter fishing, holes are cut into the ice to determine the best place to cast the net. The ideal time for this is 6 o'clock in the morning. The 1,500 meter long fishing net slowly sinks to the bottom of the lake. After waiting five or six hours, it's time to haul the net in. The fish start to appear. The first fish is considered lucky, so it usually fetches a good price. Today, luck seems to be on the fishermen's side. They've caught so many fish, they need to keep hauling them all away. The normally quiet lake is turned into a joyful place of harvest. This is a city built on an oil field. More than 50,000 drilling rigs stand on an area of 6,000 square kilometers. Here, hard work has yielded rich rewards. The discovery of the Da Qing oil field half a century ago ended China's history of lacking sufficient oil. Da Qing is synonymous with oil, yet the city has much more to offer. 60% of Da Qing is covered in wetland. In fact, it's known as the City of a Hundred Lakes.
Our flight takes us over one expanse of wetland after another. These wetlands account for one-tenth of the total area of Heilongjiang province. The Jialong wetland is home to the red-crowned crane. Of just 2,400 wild red-crowned cranes worldwide, 300 are found here in Jialong. An adult can have a wingspan of over 2 metres, yet it weighs just 10 kilograms. Being so light, it can reach extreme altitudes, up to 5,400 metres. The wetland showcases the miracle of life. Heilongjiang accounts for one-fifth of China's total area of wetland. The natural greenery here challenges the traditional impression of the province. During the rest of this flight, we'll follow the Heilongjiang River to the border. We'll fly to a city that faces Russia across the river and then head downstream to join an ice marathon. The 4,370 kilometer Heilongjiang River is an international river that flows through China, Russia and Mongolia. The river has more than 200 tributaries. These smaller rivers carry into it the fertile black soil that creates its unique color. On the frozen river, a contest of speed and power is underway. The teams are from China and Russia. The field is on the Heilongjiang River, which forms part of the border between China and Russia. Today's event is designed to bring people from the two countries together. Heihe, the city hosting the tournament, is an important border trade port. People living along the river here have been engaged in cross-border trade for over 100 years. Heihe enjoys a special relationship with Russia. On the far side of the river lies the third biggest city in Russia's far east, Blagoveshchansk. Lying less than 1,000 meters apart, these two cities are called the Sino-Russian Twin Cities. Further downstream on the Heilongjiang, we meet a group of marathon runners. The frozen surface has been used to create a racetrack. When spring returns, the ice and snow will melt and the track will once again be running water flowing to the sea. On the final leg of our journey, we'll travel between past and present. We'll pay a visit to what was once an engine house. Then we'll fly along a railway to the heart of this vast land, where we'll explore its past glories 
and future dreams. The nearby movie city was built specially for filming the TV version of this story. It seems that history is being replayed, the classic story that taking a Mount Weihu is being told again. At the foot of Mount Weihu sits a century-old town. The town originated as 200 Russian-style buildings. Work on the Chinese Eastern Railway was carried out in the 1800s. It was built by Russians and they made Hangdao Hudze the project's headquarters. This is the building where the engines were housed. Twenty years ago, with the end of the steam era, the engine house fell into disuse. The town, however, maintains its links with the outside world. Hundal Hudze remains a key link between Mu Danjiang city and the provincial capital Harbin. The Songhua is the largest tributary of the Heilongjiang. On it stands the city of Harbin. The three white arches of the Songhua Jiang Bridge are an eye catching sight. With the opening of this huge new structure in 2014, the 100 year old bridge, less than 100 meters away, became obsolete. The old bridge built in 1901 by Russians is almost as old as the city of Harbin itself. For more than 100 years, the bridge was a key link on the Chinese Eastern Railway. Harbin became the major stop on the route thanks to its geographical prominence. This is the start of the Harbin Marathon. More than 30,000 runners will race from the old city across the Songhua River to the new city. A hundred years ago, the Chinese Eastern Railway linked Harbin with the outside world. The railway not only brought goods, but also migrants. In its heyday, Harbin had 19 consulates. In the 1930s, the city was hailed as the Moscow of the Far East.
A century ago, this was a wharf on the Songhua River. Cargo ships would berth near where the Flood Control Memorial Tower stands today. Cargo unloaded from the ships would be taken away by horse-drawn carts. The weed-covered path would eventually become Zhongyang Street. As time passed, the foreigners pouring into Harbin bought land along the street, turning it into an exotic commercial district. As more migrants arrived, so churches began to spring up in Harbin. A new lifestyle emerged, with the city becoming synonymous with Russian culture. The Russian fondness for beer gave birth to China's first brewery. The Harbin locals hadn't been in the habit of drinking beer, but before long they were consuming more than 100 bottles each a year. The peculiar blend of Oriental and Western cultures is particularly evident in the area known as Lao Dawai. In an age when the influx of foreigners brought a boom in business, Chinese merchants began copying the Western style in creating their storefronts. But the rear remained very much Chinese in style. For more than 100 years, He Longjiang's fertile black soil has nurtured opportunity. Still today, people believe in the great potential of this land. As a key point on the Northeast Asia Economic Corridor, today Harbin is a vibrant city with aspirations to make a better future for itself and to help China's pursuit of win-win cooperation with other countries. <laughs>